estét kívánok! Szűs Dóra vagyok, a Matthias Corvinus Kollégium és a Denyub Institute nevében. Szeretettel köszöntök mindenkit a Patriotic Talks rendezvénysorozatunk második adásán. Múlt héten a patriotizmus fogalmát jártuk körbe, ha lemaradt az adásról, bármikor visszanézheti a www.patriotictalks.mcc.hu weboldalon. Today's episode will focus on the role of nation states in the 21st century. I welcome today's moderator, István Kis, Executive Director of the Danube Institute. István, the floor is yours. First, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Tim Marshall, who is a world-renowned journalist, author, broadcaster. He will share his thoughts with us uh, on the topic of the nation, nation states in the 21st century. Thank you for this opportunity to share views. It's a timely conference, and it's also one which all countries perhaps should have been conducting for the past 20 years. Because one of the reasons that we are divided, and I believe we're more divided than we have been for decades, is because we haven't had open and respectful conversations about these issues. You'll remember the death of the nation state theory, very popular amongst academics and intellectuals at the end of the last century. This from a, a Czech political scientist in 1999. The nation state is a very obsolete idea, of course. But of course, it never was. It was more that sections of the intellectual class wanted it to be obsolete. But describing the world as you want it to be, as opposed to how it is, when you're trying to search out problems and how to solve them, well, that doesn't survive contact with reality forever. And geography doesn't argue. The rivers, the seas, the mountains, the deserts, which shaped the identities of people around the globe are still there, and they're still shaping cultures. But from the moment we stopped being hunter-gatherers, and that's about 12,000 years ago, we at that point began to build walls. They'd never built a wall before, why would we bother? Uh, because we moved. When you become static and the things that are important to you, whether it's livestock, family or supplies, at that point I'm afraid this competition kicks in and you fear the other may come and take it. So we began building walls. Uh, Jericho is a, an early example of a very, very small city-state, about uh, perhaps three or four thousand years ago, but we've been building them ever since. Um, here's examples, four different examples of, of walls throughout history, and some of them were successful, contrary to what people say, that walls don't work. Uh, you don't have to like walls to understand that on occasions they do work. The walls of Constantinople are a very good example. They stood for a thousand years before they were breached, and every generation within that uh, was quite happy that the walls were there. And now we're still building them. There's about 65 countries who fence or wall themselves off from their neighbors. And that's a third of all the countries in the world. And yet we were told we were living in the, the flat world. There's a famous book at the beginning of the century, The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. But actually of all the border walls and fences built since World War II, more than half of them have been built in this century. So why this resurgence in nationalism and division? Why this acceptance now, reluctantly in some quarters, uh, happily in others, that the nation state is roaring back into fashion? I argue it's several factors that all came together uh, pretty much over a few years. Let's take it from 2000. For the first time in human history, technology has allowed just about everybody in the world to see how everybody else lives. And of course, many of them want to move where things are better. Uh, most of us would, whether you would put up with the dangers and, and risk the dangers to yourself and family is another matter. But the fact is that if you thought you could, many of us would. So there's no sort of moral judgment here on the people that are moving. Second thing, technology, as well as letting them see these other places, has, is allowing them to get there, uh, both physically, the ability to get on a plane, a train, etc., 
on a small boat, but also the breadcrumbs, the digital breadcrumbs that you can leave behind so that others can follow you. And again, this is something that all of us would do. Family, for most of us, comes first. Thirdly, people have been arriving uh, at an accelerated pace at a time when globalization and automation has been creating unemployment in the very places that people are coming to. Now mix in the 2008 financial crash. Uh, now that raised the welfare social net in the same places. Um, so people are coming to places where the welfare social net is higher, there's more people underneath it. And some people become suspicious of the competition that they're facing from the new arrivals. And now, finally, throw into this mix one million refugees and migrants arriving in 2015. And I would argue that all this is splintering Europe. Uh, if we look at the, the, the European Union, there is this core now, which perhaps Italy is becoming a semi-detached member, which is holding together. The periphery isn't. And you'll probably be familiar with the Visegrad group. These tensions are causing that within the European Union itself, there are now beginning to be more overt blocks uh, of influence. And the UK, although it is no longer, of course, in the EU, I think because of the tensions within the EU, the UK will be able to form other blocks with groups like the Visegrad, certainly with countries like Poland, um, with more Eurosceptic uh, parts of the EU. So I don't see that the EU can hold together in its present form, although I don't think it's going to fall apart. Sadly, none of this is going to get any easier uh, in the near future. Uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them is automation. More and more jobs are going. Migration is not going to decline. Africa has a population, for example, of 1.2 billion. Many of the experts modeling suggests that by 2060, it will have doubled, 2.4 billion. If you are persuaded that Africa within 40 years can provide a million jobs, sorry, a billion jobs, uh, and build the hospitals required to treat them, treat them the professors required to uh, create the class that can build uh, Africa, then the numbers of people that are currently moving will not increase. But if you do not believe that a billion jobs can be created in 40 years, then I think uh, it would be reasonable to suggest that the numbers will increase who are moving. And they will be moving to the very places where automation is reducing the types of jobs that many of them can do. So that's going to be difficult. But the state will survive. Um, some people, uh, on a slightly separate point, but related. Some people argue that technology such as blockchain and the internet are going to cause the state to wither away. Uh, yes, your, your job, your pension, your home insurance, your health insurance, where you get your news from. Many of these aspects of our modern life certainly are overseen by corporations. Uh, the state has less of an effect, but it does come down to fundamentals. If there's hundreds of armed men that are ransacking your neighborhood or your house, you're not going to call Google. Uh, and if somebody's crossing your border, you're not going to uh, go on Twitter and complain about it. You will call the state at that point. Well, that's an extreme example, but there is no question in my mind that the state has a major role to play uh, in our lives. It is not withering away. Uh, and in many respects, um, it has actually strengthened. A couple of examples, really. I mean, without the nation state, how do you tackle international terrorism? Which body is responsible for talking to which body in order to share uh, information to make people safer? Perfect. Or even satisfactory model uh, as a model which I believe is best for the world eventually. But like uh, democracy, uh, Mr. Churchill said, it, it's the least worst choice. And until we find something better, uh, I can't see it being out of fashion. So to the future, does it have to look uh, like this rather scary wall um, where we just build them higher and higher? I don't think so. It doesn't have to be that way at all. 
That said, walls are not a long-term solution. Uh, to prevent building the walls ever higher and higher, because people will still get over them, we A, have to hold on to our enlightenment values. I think we also absolutely have to help others everywhere in the world to achieve prosperity. Uh, this may come from a, a liberal position, but you don't have to come from a liberal position to argue it. You can come from an entirely selfish position to want everybody else to be prosperous. Because you will not be able to build the walls high enough to stop what might be coming. And so the answer is not to build the walls higher. It is to take away the push factors to combat the poverty and violence in the developing world because it is in everybody's interest. Finally, let's look back at the pale blue dot we live on, Earth. Yeah, it's a divided place and it wasn't supposed to be this way. 1987, President Reagan, you'll remember, went to Berlin. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And two, day, two years later, it, it, it fell and they were heady times which some intellectuals predicted an end of history, but I think most of us know that history has and had other ideas, but I think the cement for the dividing lines was already mixed and, and it was laid without many of us even noticing. Those divisions are, are now there. On the plus side, I, I retain a belief in our ability to cooperate, to think and to build and to give us the capacity to fill the spaces between the walls with hope to build the bridges between us and, and then you can start taking those walls down. I'm confident. I think it's important to keep positive. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our panel lists of our discussion. First, David Engels, who is a professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Rudiger Voigt, who is a professor emeritus at the Universitat des Bundeswehr in München, Germany. Francesco Giubile, uh, who is an Italian uh, author and also the founder and president of Nazione Futura, a think tank in Italy. Eduardo Fernandez uh, Luna, who is the head of international relations at the Spanish think tank uh, Dissenso. Dr. Roman Jok, uh, who is the executive director of the Civic Institute in Prague. Ilya Shapiro, who is the director of the Robert, Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the K2 Institute in Washington, DC. Last but not least, I would like to welcome uh, Jörg Schöflin, who is a former member of the European Parliament from Hungary, and who is now currently a senior research fellow at IASC. At least since the fall of the Soviet Union, it has become a popular notion, uh, most likely on the left, but also sometimes on the right, that uh, nation states have somehow become obsolete. Uh, I would kind of like to ask the panel members, uh, but what do they think about this sentiment? Do they agree with this or do they think that this is a, a wrong uh, notion? When I speak about European patriotism and the nation state, I mean the love for those things that unite us Europeans and make us different from the rest of the world. Our Greco-Roman roots, our Christian spirituality, our wonderful art history, our regional traditions, our national diversity, our technological and scientific achievements, our specific view on how men should always try to excel and so forth. This is why I'm quite in favor of the continued existence of nation states as the cradles of democracy, even within a European context, and quite fond also of the patriotism in the Visegrad states in general and Poland in particular. The patriotism I experience since living in Poland is always strongly linked to a commitment to the true historical European identity, while in many other Western countries, references to our common cultural heritage are always put aside in favor of either a purely nationalist or globalist patriotism, but nothing in between. Uh, the answer is no, I don't agree with this at all. This is actually an ideologically driven proposition, basically by the European left or Western left, which would very much like to see the disappearance of the nation state. You know, it's the old uh, confusion of the is and the ought. Um, but in reality, if you look at the reality from sociological, political theory, um, anthropological, whatever, 
disciplinary perspective, we see that the nation lives on, as indeed does the state. Now, those two are actually very different categories. They come together for a number of purposes. But there's no question of the state disappearing. Um, 20 years ago, there were many people who talked about, oh, this is the old Marxist term, the withering away of the state. Um, Zygmunt Bauman, whose name must be known to some of you, uh, came quite close to arguing this back in the 90s. But in fact, it hasn't happened. The state has a number of functions, even in a globalized world, basically to protect society, to allocate goods, to allocate values, um, activities of this kind. And at the end of the day, what holds the state together is a shared culture. And that shared culture, it's not the only factor in nationalism, nationhood, ethnicity, but it's a very important one. So what we're really looking at is that there's the nation, there's the state, they overlap and sustain each other and continue to do so. If we look at the role and influence and impact of nation states, we don't see that any processes of globalization or any other uh, trends have undermined the power and role and importance of such nation states like the United States of America or China, People's Republic of China, or even Russian Federation. And if we look at our continent, at Europe, and look at the last, let us say, five years, we have seen several crises. The first one of them was the great migration crisis uh, in the two, two, in the 2015, 2016. Who was capable to respond in the most efficient way to that crisis? Well, those were nation states. People were waiting for the response of the European Union and no response came. But particular nation states were the most efficient and most capable to react. Or let us look at, the, at this year, 2020, and the pandemics, coronavirus pandemics, uh, which forms of cooperation were the most efficient to respond and which responded in the quickest way? Well, once again, nation states. Uh, European Union was good at proclamations, but those were nation states who crossed borders, uh, administered health securing measures, and the peoples, the people accepted the decisions, even tough decisions, uh, restricting, for example, uh, our rights to enjoy food or drinks in bars and restaurants. People understood that and accepted that from their own nation states. So my strong belief is that the nation states are going to be the most natural and uh, uh, dimension of social political cooperation with the greatest confidence on the part of the people into exactly nation states. Nation states as we become a more uh, a world community uh, or something. And yet, uh, um, I think that's a bit of a pipe dream. We're still living in nation states, even in our globalizing world, um, uh, nations, countries, and nationalist movements uh, are not disappearing. In fact, they're, they're gaining momentum in, in many places. Uh, this reminds me of uh, actually 20 years ago, uh, uh, I was a grad student at the London School of Economics and I remember one of my final exam questions, we had a choice of different essay questions in this particular international politics class uh, and, and this one question asked whether the nation state uh, is still an important factor in the global system. Uh, that was a time of course of uh, the internet was growing and more international trade. This was pre 9-11, uh, kind of a holiday from history a, a little bit, but uh, certainly then, but even more now, uh, I think uh, there's a renaissance of the nation state of the, of the Westphalian system uh, in the 21st century. Uh, the nation state never really went away, uh, even with increased globalization, that is a trade in goods, instant communication, modern travel, and therefore a uh, spread of cultural uh, objects and cultural access. Uh, each country still very much controls its own destiny. I, I don't agree with uh, this uh, affirmation because I think that the nation states are still alive and the pandemic of the coronavirus is the, the perfect example that testimony how the national states are 
alive. In this month, we lived the, the hand of the globalization. We lived the, the hand of the, the open society. We understand the importance of the national states. We understand that uh, we, we have to, to, to live in a very strong national states because we understand the importance, for example, of the borders. We understand that a society without border is a society where, for example, a virus or in another way, migrations can spread all over the single national state and all over the single country in a very quickly way. But the national state is also important to conserve the concept of the identity. We are living in a society, we are living in a world where every day we are losing the concept of the identity. And now the sovereign national identities, such as the European Union, are losing the importance of the identity. They are losing, for example, the centrality of the Christian roots for our civilization. And the, the national states, especially in Europe, are very linked with, with the concept of the uh, Christian roots, are very linked to the conservative values, such as the family, for example, the importance of the family in a, in a society. They're linked with the importance of the community. They're linked with the importance of the religions. In the time of globalization and individualism, such terms as nation or nation state are in trouble. The official today's Europe sees nation states trying to become absorbed into regional governance. In fact, the integration into international and supranational organization leads to several problems. Certain decisions vital to the nation are no longer hit by the democratically legitimized institution. Europe is under constant economic stress because of extreme debt conditions and weaker economies, which find it impossible to run national economies based on nothing but social welfare and tourism. Immigrants from the failed European states, from the Middle East and from Africa, are trying to escape from war and poverty. That causes continued friction with the clash of Islamic religious fervor and the agnostic secular West. Thus, some interested political movements proclaim the decline of the nation state and argue that nation and nation state are threatening the peaceful world order. World society and world state would lead to a better political system. Those people call themselves cosmopolitans. I call them dream dancers. Note two. Cosmopolitanism is the idea that all human beings should be members of a single community, political and legal order. Second, staying on the uh, topic of sovereignty, it seems that in the 21st century, uh, big multinational companies are increasingly becoming a kind of an obstacle for national sovereignty. This is especially true for big uh, tech companies uh, like Facebook or Twitter. Uh, that's why we have coined the term of digital sovereignty. I would like to ask the panel members what do they think about the concept of digital sovereignty and how can nation states protect themselves from these big uh, multinational companies, especially tech companies? This is certainly one of the big issues of the 21st century. In my view, there can only be one solution, a strong and relentless defense of morality as well as the liberty of expression. Should the censorship applied by big tech giants be against the laws in vigor in a nation state, the state should fine these companies and, if necessary, ban them completely. The only language that is understood by those giants is the language of force. Of course, this is only possible either in a strong nation state or within a European Union that would defend its cultural identity and true democratic values instead of undermining them as today. Also, it is very doubtful that the current majority of citizens, at least in Western Europe, would be able to understand and that such a policy of independence would imply certain sacrifices in the field of the current material comfort and moral liberalism. And I do not think the large masses, at least in the West, 
are ready for such a political maturity. About the national states, and we talk about the sovereignty of the borders, but we have also to talk about the digital sovereignty. What we are seeing in the United States after the election, we are seeing that a private a private company, I'm talking about Twitter, but I also can talk about Facebook, a private company can delete the tweet or can delete the post of all the citizens, but also can delete the post of the President of the United States. So when we talk about democracy, we have to talk about the free speech. The free speech is the base of all democracy. If the, uh, we live in a society w where we can have a free speech, we are not living in a democracy. So it's important that the state, it's important that the nation underline and defend the concept of the free speech. And it is important also to prevent the, the, the role of these big companies such as Facebook or such as Google or such as Twitter, all, all the, the Silicon Valley big, big company, but also in Europe we have some the, 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 uh, company like that, because uh, also um, it's linked with the concept of the security, because all these companies as our private data, all these companies uh, have the private date of all the European citizens, have the private date of, of all the American citizens, and so it's linked with, with the security of all the citizens, but it's linked also with the national security. So it's important to have a digital sovereignty for a, on one reason, the concept of the free speech, and in the second point, for a concept of the, the security of the national state and the security of the, the single citizens. Partly, I think, because of the Washington consensus, um, the Western world has allowed the digital giants that you mentioned to accumulate enormous power. And also because Europe has been extremely slow in developing its own alternatives. We are now in a situation where various companies, including the digital ones that you mentioned, um, have control over aspects of our lives we're often not even aware of it. Um, there've been there's been some counter movement. The French have done it. I think we've seen elements from the European Union. Um, but until we get into a frame of mind where the European Union, because I can't see any individual member state doing this, is ready to start financing a European digital giant. Well, that's a long process and an expensive one. Uh, I can't see how we're going to be escaping this particular dilemma. You, 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 I think probably you know that uh, China and Russia, possibly other uh, India, I don't know, other countries are developing their own digital um, giants, I don't know, but digital worlds in competition with the American digital giants. So I don't know how much this is good. The way in which everybody expected, I think that the American expectation was, that if you're rich, you're going to be peaceable, pacific. The answer is no. A lot of countries have spent their accumulated money on more armament. Um, and it has not made the world safer at all. And thirdly, this enormous accumulation of money throughout the world, in the global world, has given rise to, I actually think, unbearable inequalities. And we see the way that that's working out in Europe, discontent, dissatisfaction with, let's call it democracy, let's call the baby by its name. And quite honestly, until the European world accepts that Europe has a duty, the so-called social pillar, towards its citizens, uh, towards protecting its citizens uh, and de doing something with the inequality, uh, this dissatisfaction will remain in being and will affect democratic politics. We need clear rules imposed from the nation state. Obviously, when nation states interact with the aforementioned multinationals, we, we have problems. And uh, we need clear rules. We need a clear regulations. 
I cannot think of more things to defend ourselves from companies that acquire their information, supposedly voluntary from citizens, only in this way with a clear regulation that punishes the potential abuses that these companies can carry out, will the problem be progressively resolved. In Spain, for example, the regulation is confusing and unclear, and uh, this problem complicates the search for solutions to this big problem. How could nation states react to their power, which is tremendous? It's a really tough question. I don't see that any single nation state could do that efficiently unless it would employ totalitarian measures like the Chinese national state does. Uh, and we see on one hand uh, a surrender of those digital companies like Facebook towards Chinese communists. But on the other hand, they are quite tough against free and democratic societies. So for me, the most important question is going to be what are going to be results in the United States of America? Because many of those companies both originated and or are based in the US. And I know that there are now hearings in the US Senate, which try to restrict the power of those social networks to censor certain point of, points of view, especially those conservative. We can say with certainty that both Twitter, Facebook and other companies are prejudiced against conservative points of view and they practice censorship against conservative positions in free democratic societies on the one hand. And on the other hand, they, they have surrendered to Chinese communists and censor pro-democratic views in China. So I have some expectations that especially young Republican politicians, senators, would be more efficient to bring some basic measures of justice to prevent censorship of conservative positions in Western societies, and perhaps try to influence those companies to be more pro-freedom in uh, such totalitarian countries like the China is. The first, first question would be about the future of the European Union. Most of the panelists are from Europe, so of course this is an increasingly interesting question. The term pooled sovereignty has become a popular concept in the European Union, but a lot of people are criticizing this uh, term. Uh, I would like to ask the panelists what do they think about pooled sovereignty and also how do they see is a, a European United States possible or should we aim to have a Europe of nation states? The best case scenario or the most efficient way for cooperation would be a European Union of nation states. If somebody would like to break the the position of nation states in the European Union, he or she will not succeed to breaking nation states, but he or she will succeed to break the European Union. That would be the real danger. So that's one point. The second point is that we have many political ideological disagreements in Europe. Uh, peoples and especially politicians in Western Europe are more to the liberal left, especially to the green environmentalist policies. Peoples and politicians, representatives in Central Europe are more skeptical about radical green environmentalist agendas. So the way to go to the future is by compromises and by respecting nation states and by having the European central institutions like the European Commission in a subservient role to the peoples and to the nation states. Well, I think that these are, these are two, two two extremes. In, in, in my view, the, the universalism that is displayed by today's European leftist liberal elites um, is as dangerous as the nationalist arrogance still displayed by some conservative uh, people. We need to develop a healthy European patriotism. Uh, chauvinist nationalism forgets about the fact that, uh, as the uh, great philosopher Ortega y Gasset had put it, four fifth of what seems to be purely national character characteristics are in fact common European heritage. Forgetting about what unites us as Europeans may become dangerous, especially today as we need to work all together in order to fight against uh, Islamization, mass immigration, political correctness, or the dangers coming from China. But this is also by thinking 
in, in purely global, universalist, multiculturalist dimensions is equally dangerous as the formative power of historical cultures is so strong that the uh, fictitious utopian one world that green leftist and liberal ideologists are trying to achieve will only end in civil war, a clash of civilization and a global catastrophe, exactly as at the end of the Roman Republic in the first century BC. Thus, now we should, of course, strive for peace with our neighbors. We should never forget the deep differences in mentality and strategic interest between them and us Europeans and work in the best interest of our of our continent. This is a conviction for which in my, my book, uh, Renovatio Europa, uh, I have uh, coined the term Hesperialism, and uh, which has also given rise to the redaction of a tentative preamble for a future Hesperialist confederation of European nation. Uh, its uh, basic idea is simple. On the one hand, the competences of the EU need to be reduced to only those fields of action necessary for the survival of our whole civilization, such as the defense of borders, infrastructure, fight against crime, science, etc. On the other hand, the European Union needs to be grounded again on traditional, not globalist values. I know, of course, that Western identity if we want to keep our nation safe, you could say it simply, we have to become European patriots and fight against what the European Union has become in the name of true Europe. I think that the European United States is the wrong way to build the European Union. We have to build a Europe of people, we have to build a Europe of nation, we have to build a Europe of country, but so, so we have to build a, a confederate Europe, but the European United States is not the, the correct way. The problem of this European Union is that it is a union based on economic values and is, is not so a European Union based on cultural values. We in every time the importance of the economy, but we never underline the importance of the common Christian roots, for example. We never underline the importance of a common European identity. And this is a big problem for our civilization. We, we, every day we, we look in France, for example, or in Germany or in Austria, presently, some attack by Islamic terrorism. And we, we, we can fight against Islamic terrorism if we don't have uh, our roots, that's if we don't underline our roots. Another big problem of this European Union is that the European Union is built on two treaties, the Treaty of Maastricht and the Treaty of Lisbon. And in these two treaties are political and economic treaty. But in 1950, in Rome, three very important Christian leaders, such as the Gaspari from Italy, Adenauer from Germany, and Adenauer and Schumann from Germany, sorry, they signed the Treaty of Rome. And in this treaty, they want to build a European Union based on cultural values. But this treaty was delayed by the next two treaties, the Treaty of Lisbon and the Treaty of Maastricht. And this European Union is a, is the perfect example of the globalization is a perfect example of a global world, but we don't need a, a globalization inside, inside our European Union. We need to rediscover our values, we need to rediscover our identity. So that's the way to build a European Union based on nation and European Union based on single people. Fundamentally, however, people don't feel allegiances to supranational institutions. That doesn't mean those institutions are useless, but we have to recognize that, for example, the European Union uh, isn't and shouldn't be a super parliament that dictates national domestic policies. It facilitates trade among Europe. It facilitates exchange of ideas and, and people and goods uh, and perhaps a common national defense, but it's not a super parliament. And the United Nations, even less so. It's, it's a talking shop. It's a place where people from around the world get together to exchange ideas and maybe, maybe collaborate on, on these issues, but it's not a world government and shouldn't be uh, moving in that direction. From our opinion, we have to think of another model of the European Union. 
it seems uh, that if you do not if you do not accept the supranational model that is supported by the european institutions you are against the european union and uh, as i said from our point of view this is completely false obviously and uh, at a particular level and I, I am aware of the benefits that the European Union has brought, the single market, for example. We have to open a new period of reflection of the European Union, and we have to find an answer to the question, what do we want? Nowadays, the distance between the citizens of the different EU countries and the technocratic elites of Brussels is too big. In that sense, we should open a debate on two, two topics, functional areas and institutional capacity. In other words, perhaps it is necessary to redefine the functional areas of the European institutions, returning to a more intergovernmental logic in line with the sentiment of the majority of Europeans. On the other hand, the institutional capacity of the European institutions must be clear. There can be no doubt about who has or does not have the competence to solve a problem. The Union was born as a Union of States. In this sense, and more than moving towards a federation, we should, we should maintain the Union as a Union of States. This Union has made the European Union one of the great projects of the 20th century. The reasons uh, to, to cede more competence from the nation state to the European Union. More when a lot of people in the nation state know nothing about the European Union. If we go out to the street and ask people about the European Union, the Spanish people know nothing about the European Union, basically. They, they don't know uh, their representatives in the European Union, which is a really important thing. They don't know anything about the Commission, the European Commission, and how it works, this executive power. And they don't know nothing about the justice system. So I think the problem is the problem between the elite the establishment and the Europeans, because it's uh, the, the supranational idea is an elite idea. The last question will be perhaps the easiest. Uh, I would kindly like to ask the panel members, what do they think, what is the biggest threat uh, towards national sovereignty in the 21st century? I would say to, to normal, dem especially democratic, middle-sized nation states, like uh, our states in uh, Central Europe's, Euro Europe are, the, the biggest threat is the threat is the threat from the Chinese state. I don't think that any international or supranational organization could coerce nation states as effectively as one uh, very wealthy, very powerful, very arrogant and very assertive nation state, uh, in particular Chinese nation state, can and could and wishes to do that. The first one we've discussed, uh, this is digitalization. Digitalization means the loss of a considerable number of jobs, including jobs which have been relatively safe until now in the knowledge economy. Relatively low level knowledge economy jobs will be lost to digitalization, which means that in certainly some countries, we're facing an overproduction of graduates. And that isn't good. We've seen this in various countries where there are too many graduates who don't get the graduate premium, who don't get the employment which they think they should get, they become radicalized. Um, if you want a good historical example, have a look at interwar Romania, which was a very radical, right-wing radical movement, too many graduates coming out of, for example, Yas University. The second problem is demography. Um, we have this is two wings of it, if you like. There's the demographic pressure on Europe from outside Europe, Africa, Middle East, possibly other parts of the world, which Europe has great difficulty coping with. Um, Europe isn't necessarily getting the kind of labor force that it wants, 
or when it is, it takes several years to train it. This is the German experience. And also the importation of labor from other parts of the world brings a cultural problem with it. How do you integrate people into your own normativity from a totally alien culture? It's not true that there's a single world and a single culture. At the same time, for Central Europe, the problem is that we're losing people because the incomes, the wages are much higher in the West than they are in Hungary or Poland or Estonia. Since the end of communism, approximately 20 million people have left this region, the former communist states, and they've gone to various countries in the West, not just in Europe, by the way, but also the United States, Canada, Australia, I don't know where. Effectively, this means that because these people are educated here in Central Europe, we subsidize the much richer West. It's a premium. And lastly, the Green Deal. A green future, again, means a massive transformation requiring a great deal of capital input and capital poor countries like the Central European countries will find it very difficult to cope. Um, but it's going to raise really serious problems oh, for Europe as a whole, of course. I think it probably the biggest threat to the nation state in this age is the, the, um, the raise of the national borders because we, we forget the importance of national border. If we look to our values, we can talk about the Roman age, the Roman Empire, the great Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman talked about the concept of limes. The, the limes is a fundamental concept in the Roman Empire. Inside the limes, there was the Roman Empire. Outside the limes, there was the barbarian. So it's important to rediscover the concept of the limits and today the concept of the limits is our borders. We have to defend our borders. That's not meaning that we are against immigration. We are against irregular immigration. We are against the people who arrive, for example, in, in the south of Italy, in Sicily, in Lampedusa, without respect our rules, without respect the rules, not only of Italy, but the rules of the, all the European Union. Because the, there is, I think, a big mistake that sometimes the, the people think that when migrants arrive to Italy, it's a problem only of Italy or it's a problem only of Greece or Spain. But when immigrants arrive in Italy, he arrives in the European Union. So it's a big problem for everybody. It's a big problem for um, France, it's a big problem for Germany, it's a big problem also for, for you. And so we have to defend our borders. And the, the defense of the border is obviously a problem of all the national states, but it's a problem also of the European Union. The European Union has to help the single national states to defend our borders. And the situation is quite difficult in our country because every day um, hundreds of people arrive from the sea, from the Mediterranean hey, and from the Mediterranean Sea. They arrive in Sicily, they arrive in Lampedusa, they arrive in Puglia, and the same is in Grecia, in Greece. The same is in Spain. And so we have also to try to, to change the situation in the north of Africa because the problem of Libya, the problem of uh, Tunisia, the problem of uh, other important countries in the north of Africa is a problem also for the European Union. So if we can defend our national borders, I think that this is the biggest threat for uh, the national states in our century. Well, I could speak a lot about the threats of multilateralism or technocracy or multiculturalism or economic asymmetries and so on. But I think that all these are only exterior phenomena. The, the real reason for the attack against the nation state is the growing political, cultural and moral irresponsibility of the citizens who are making all the problems mentioned above possible through the explicit or, or implicit acceptance of what is happening today through elections, everyday life, compliance and, and so forth. Indeed, the European citizen has been taught to hate his own civilization, to believe in whatever the mainstream media are saying, to value his personal hedonism much higher than liberty, etc. 
This is why I think that the reform of education and media is paramount if we really want to change our future and protect our regional, our national, and also our Western identity. I'd like to discuss the problems of the current political order. The globalization has changed the conditions for the democratic nation state. The citizens of liberal democratic states have a strong feeling that there is a growing gap between global complexity and their wish to participate in political decisions. What conclusion can we draw from this? The most dangerous, dangerous problem for the democratic order is the loss of their traditional confidence in democratic rules and politicians. What we need in this turbulent is a state that is firmly anchored by a nation of citizens who share the same sentiment, patriotism. It is or should be a democratic nation. And it is necessary for such a state to play a part in international or supranational institutions. Of course, it is necessary, and it is a hindrance to be a nationalist. Slide 23. Let me answer this question with the words of the famous Indian freedom fighter Mahatma Gandhi. It is impossible for one to be an internationalist without being a nationalist. Internationalism is possibly only when nationalism becomes a I am convinced that nation states are under threat nowadays, and I can say that there are two types of threats. Internal threats, endogenous, and external threats, exogenous. Regarding external threats, one of them is the, the European Union itself, uh, but not also the European Union, the international organizations and all the organizations that nowadays are defending supranationalist ideologies. Uh, it is clear that the debate at the moment in the European Union is a debate between supranationalism and intergovernmentalism. Clearly, there is an elite that wants to cede powers to the European institutions in order to weak the nation states that composed it and that gave rise to it. István, nagyon szépen köszönjük ezt az izgalmas panelbeszélgetést. Az első zárásaként a témához kapcsolódva szeretném megkérdezni a véleményedet az európai kontextusról. Az első kérdésem az az lenne, hogy az EU jövőjéből szóló viták kapcsán gyakran hallunk és olvasunk a nemzetállami versus a föderális Európa elképzelésekről. A kérdésem az arra vonatkozna, hogy ez sokaknak egy nagyon elvont kérdésnek tűnhet, egy átlagos magyar állampolgár számára ez fontos kérdése, fontos -e erről beszélnünk. Köszönöm a kérdést. Úgy gondolom, hogy igen. Tehát lehet, hogy egy hétköznapi ember számára az, hogy nemzeti szuverenitás, vagy az, hogy föderalizmus egy furcsán hangzó idegen szó lehet, vagy egy elvont fogalom, amit nem teljesen értenek, de úgy gondolom, hogy mégis nagyon fontos, hogy azokat a döntéseket, amiket, amik mindenkinek az életét befolyásolják, hol hozzák meg. Egy nagyon kézenfekvő példa erre, az például az óraátállítás kérdése, ami most sokat szerepelt a hírekben, nyilván mindenkinek az életét befolyásolja, de azért úgy gondolom, hogy nem teljesen mindegy, hogy egy ilyen fontos kérdés, ami tényleg mindenkinek az életét befolyásolja, azt hol döntenek el. Itt Magyarországon, Budapesten, a budapesti parlamentben, ahol ugye az emberek szavaznak, ismerik a képviselőiket, az ott esetben be tudnak menni a képviselőhöz, vannak fogadási órák, vagy Brüsszelbe a az Európai Parlament, illetve a különböző brüsszeli szervek, ugyanis persze nyilvánvalóan lehet átadni a szuverenitást, de annak mindig az adott országnak a zakaratán kell, hogy múljon, és szabadnak kell lenni ennek az átadásnak. És sok esetben most azt látjuk, hogy ez nem teljesen így működik az Európai Unióban. Adott esetben a, ugye sokat hallunk arról, hogy az Európai Unió parlamentje egyébként demokratikusan nem teljesen legitim. Ugye nagyon sokan próbálnak ezen változtatni. Felmerült például az a lehetőség, hogy a különböző párcsaládok transnacionális listát állítsanak, tehát összeurópai listát. 
hogy esetleg ezt tudná növelni a, a választási részvételt, és akkor legitimitást tudna adni a parlamentnek, de egy csomó kutatás mutatja, hogy ez nem működne. Például volt olyan elemzés, ami bemutatta, hogy ha mondjuk van egy német ö, szocialista bájtottságú ember, nagyobb eséllyel fog szavazni egyébként egy német konzervatívra is, mint egy magyar vagy szlovák ö, szocialista jelöltre. Tehát alapvetően mi mindig felülírja a nemzeti érdek, úgymond a, az európai érdeket, és amíg ez így van, addig úgy gondolom, hogy nagyon is fontos az, hogy a, az európai országok megfelelő nemzeti szolgálatításon legyen. Köszönöm. Itt említetted az aktualitást, és, és ennek kapcsán szeretnék behozni egy másik szomorú, de, de ugyanakkor nagyon aktuális témát, a, a koronavírus helyzetet és járványt. És azt láttuk az első hullám kapcsán, hogy gyakran a hatékony döntések azok nemzetállami szinten születtek, ezzel szemben a nemzetközi szervezetek ajánlásai, javaslatai gyakran nagyon lassúak és bürokratikusak voltak. Az lenne a kérdésem, hogy ebből levonhatunk-e bármilyen következtetést, és mit gondolsz, hogy az ilyen globális kihívásokat milyen szinten lehet a leghatékonyabban kezelni? Úgy gondolom, hogy abszolút el lehet volna sajnos következtetéseket. Tehát nagyon jól látszott pont a Covid kapcsán, hogy a nemzetközi szervezetek nagyon lassan reagáltak. Itt a legfontosabb talán az egészségügyi világszervezet, ami amellett, hogy lassan reagált, sok esetben egymásnak ellentmondó információkat is adott a tagállamoknak. Például a leghíresebb eset az, amikor a kínaiaknak javasolták egyébként azt, hogy az embereket szűrjék, lezárják a határaikat, mérjék a lázukat, és ennek ellenére, tehát Kínát dicsérték, hogy ezt teszi, viszont a többi, mondjuk például európai tagállamoknak azt javasolták, hogy ne zárják le határaikat, és nincs, nincs szükség testhőmérséklet mérése például a repülőtereken. Tehát ez a, és ez a legelejétől így működött, és ez a sokszor egymástak ellentmondó, kaotikus kommunikáció, ez nagyban akadályozta az első egy hónapban, két hónapban a koronavírus elleni hatékony védekezést, és ez az Európai Unióra is igaz volt sajnos. Az Európai Unió is túlságosan megbízott az egészségügyi világszervezet ajánlásaiban, a sokszor ellentmondó nyilatkozatokban, és ugye ezért is például Európában is nagyon sokáig a legtöbb ország nem zárta le a határait, nem volt megfelelő ellenőrzés, és amikor meg ez már megtörtént, akkor sok esetben Késő volt. Tehát az jól látható, hogy ezek a nemzetközi szervezetek annak ellenére, hogy most már lassan 70 éve halljuk, hogy egyre globálisabb világban élünk, olyan problémák vannak, amiket nem lehet megoldani nemzeti szinten. Ez részben igaz, de sajnos a, a, a gyakorlati példák azt mutatják, hogy a nemzetközi szervezetek se feltétlenül oldják meg ezeket a problémákat sokkal hatékonyabban. Az ENSZ ugye van legtöbbször itt a, a célkeresztben, a rengeteg konfliktus kapcsán nem tudta kezelni a, a, a konfliktusokat, a ruandai vérengzést nagyon sokan a, a a részben az ensz is hibását teszik azért, hogy nem megfelelően kezelt a helyzetet, szintén ellen, egymásnak ellentmondó nyilatkozatokat tett ebben a konfliktusban, de a boszniai konfliktusban sem ö, tudtak olyan ö, erővel fellépni, ahogyan kellett volna. Tehát az látszik, hogy minél feje próbáljuk rakni ezeket a problémákat, annál bürokratikusabb és nehezebben megoldhatók lesznek. És egyébként számos tanulmány is igazolja ezt például a különböző regionális együttműködések kapcsán. Nagyon érdekes, hogy az Európai Unió sok esetben a legrosszabbból szerepel. Tehát ő a leg inkább ugye fejlett regionális együttműködés, a legfejlettebb bürokráciával, a legtöbb intézmény. Az ember azt gondolná, hogy a különböző válság kezelésében az Európai Unió a leghatékonyabb is, de számos tanulmány mutatja azt, hogy sajnos ez nem igaz. Tehát olyan nemzetközi szervezetek, meg regionális szervezetek, amik egyébként kevesebb tagállammal rendelkeznek, vagy adott esetben kevésbé bürokratizáltak, sokszor hatékonyabban lépnek fel, mint az Európai Unió, ami amúgyan gondolnánk a legfejlettebb ilyen együttműködés. Tehát tényleg látszik, hogy amíg ezek a szervezetek nincsenek, nem, nem demokratikus lapon működnek, nincs megfelelő elszámoltatóság, addig nem fognak hatékonyan működni sajnos. Nagyon szépen köszönjük. Én is köszönöm. Bízom benne, hogy nézőink számára is tartalmas volt a mai beszélgetés. Szeretettel várjuk Önöket jövő héten csütörtökön, este 8 órától a Patriotic Talks következő alkalmán. A témánk a politikai korrektség lesz. Szép estét, viszontlátásra!